Well, good morning. How are we doing this morning? You guys doing all right? Awesome. If you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn to the book of Hebrews. It's towards the end of your Bible. If you've made it to Revelation, you're too far and you just need to backtrack a little bit. If you don't own a copy of the Bible, or if you don't have a copy of the Bible with you, I invite you to uh, download the Crosspoint app. You can search for that, uh, search in Crosspoint KS, and uh, you can find that there. You can download that. You can uh, follow along with today's message. You can take notes. You can email those to yourself after the message is done. You can worship the Lord through giving um, on the app with a one-time gift or a recurring gift. Um, and most importantly, you can access a copy of God's Word right there on the app. And while you're finding your way to Hebrews, let me just say hello. I'm Jason Waller, one of the pastors here, and uh, I don't have a guitar around my neck this morning. I, uh, and I, I don't plan on breaking out in song during the service, but it could possibly happen. So if you're, if you're waiting, just know that's not the plan. Today I have the honor of preaching God's word to you, and it's an honor to do that, to preach the gospel to you, to preach the same old news, of the good news of Jesus Christ. You know, we're, we're forgetful people. I am a musician, as I alluded to, and I own just two guitars. My wife was here last service, and I, I made the shameless plug that most musicians have more than that. I just have two. And uh, one of my guitars, my, my favorite guitar, my oldest guitar, is, is sitting at my house right now. And it has a, a padlock on the case, a three-digit padlock. And it's interesting um, that, that that padlock, I don't know why they have one on there, but if you were to steal my guitar, it would be so sad if you couldn't play it. So I'm just going to give you the padlock this morning in case you find your hands on it. It's 627. It's 627, and, and that wasn't on accident or by coincidence. I plan for it to be that because it's also, there's also another important thing that has 627 in it, and that's my wife and I's anniversary. It is June 27th, and so I don't want to forget because that would not go well for me. I love my wife, and I want to celebrate my wife, and so we need reminders. Turn to your neighbor this morning and say, you need reminders. Tell them this morning. All right, you need reminders. And we need reminders not just of dates, right? We need reminders not just of dates and anniversaries, but we need ultimately reminders of the good news of the gospel. We see this all throughout Scripture. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, he says, I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel. We need reminded of the good news of Jesus. And we throw that word gospel around a lot because it's our only hope as a church. So let me just really quick just unpack in a, in a nutshell what the gospel is. The gospel is the good news of Jesus Christ. It's good news for what God has done, what we could never do for ourselves. Jesus was born of a virgin. Anybody here? No, don't, let, don't raise your hands. He was born of a virgin, miraculously. He lived a perfect life, a life that God called you and I to live. And then he died a sinner's death in our place as our substitute on the cross. And he rose again after three days, victorious over sin, hell, and the grave, so that all who trust in him, all who would heed this good news, believe this good news, might have everlasting life with him. Amen? Amen. Amen. And that everlasting life starts now. This is the good news of the gospel. Now, the gospel is not just the ABCs to the Christian faith. It's the XYZ as well. It is the, if, there, if the school of Christianity, um, if you could say it was a school, it wouldn't just be one classroom designated for the gospel. No, the gospel is the school itself that every other classroom finds its way in. How do I, how do I be married as a Christian? How do I raise these crazy kids as a Christian? How do I do? All of these things happen in context of the gospel. It's the good news. And so today's message is all about reminders because we need to be reminded of the good news of Jesus. So we've cleverly entitled this sermon, A Great Reminder. A Great Reminder from Hebrews 9, 11 through 28. If you haven't been with us this summer, we've been walking through the book of Hebrews verse by verse. And a couple of weeks ago, we just made it past the halfway point. And chapters 1 through 8, we now see in 9 and 10 is kind of just a reminder, a rehashing of everything that we've already read. Because God set it up that way. Because why? We need reminders, right? We need reminders. So this morning, before we... Uh, get into it. Let me pray for us and ask God's word to do what I cannot do for us today. 
God, we're thankful to be in your presence, to get to sing with your people, to get to rejoice in the good news of Jesus. Lord, to to bring our burdens, to bring our cares, to bring our sorrows, to bring our suffering um, to you and to, to remember our ultimate hope that it's not found in this world, but it is found in your word and ultimately in the word of the gospel. That is our hope, Jesus, and Jesus alone, as we've already sang and declared to you. God, I pray that this morning, God, that we would leave as more believing believers for those of us who trust in Christ, that today we would see Christ more clearly, that we would worship Christ more deeply, and that we would obey Christ more fully as a result. God, I pray for those who are far from you, who don't know you, God, today you would rescue, you'd show yourself to be mighty to save, God, that you would rescue, and uh, God, that you would do uh, what I cannot do. Lord, that you would rescue people out of their religiosity who think that checking off um, the boxes of their faith, of coming to church and reading their Bible and, and just doing enough good, God, that they would see that they could never measure up as we open your text today and that they would come to Christ. They would look to him. God, I pray for those who are needing rescued out of their rebellion. They're blatantly, um, God, going against your will and your ways. I pray that you would help them see that they are grasping at wind, that chasing after power and pleasure and purpose and the things of this world will never satisfy them. And would they turn to Jesus today and find that everything they hunger for and look for is ultimately found in him. God, we pray that you would get glory today as we open your word together. In Jesus' name, we pray. All God's people said. Amen. Amen. Well, we'll be in Hebrews 9, like I said, starting in verse 11. Let's go ahead and uh, let's get after it. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is not this creation. So let me just pause this for, for a second here. What the author of Hebrews does throughout the book of Hebrews is he's contrasting the Old Covenant. He's contrasting the Old Testament. He's contrasting the sacrificial system with Jesus. That's why we've called it greater because it's, he's a greater high priest. He's a greater uh, sacrifice. Jesus is a greater place of worship. He has given us a new access to God that we could not have on our own. And that's what we see happening right here. Jesus is the greater, and, and, and he provides a greater and more perfect tent. We see that. Now, this tent isn't something you pick up from Dick's Sporting Goods and just throw up in your backyard, right? This is not made with earthly hands. So he's not saying it's a tent because it's a literal tent. It's a tent because it symbolizes the very presence and dwelling place of God. And that's what made all the sacrifices worth it. Just a side note. It wasn't like, how can we appease God? It was, I just want to be with him. I just want to be with him. Well, his greater and perfect, more perfect tent comes through Jesus. So let's keep going. Verse 12, it says, he has entered once and for all. Everybody say, once for all. Once for all. We'll see this phrase in some shape or form in four different places in today's text. It's a very important phrase. Jesus has entered once and for all into the holy places, not by the means of blood, of the blood of goats and calves, but by the means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer, sanctify for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, how much more will Christ purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? See, while the blood of of bulls and goats in the Old Testament could temporarily and externally cleanse, they had zero power to transform the heart. They couldn't internally cleanse like Jesus can, and they couldn't eternally cleanse like Jesus can. Lauren and I love uh, Colorado peaches. Anybody here like Colorado peaches? Have you had those? It's just like a whole new level of sweetness and goodness from the Lord. I just want you to imagine, I mean, they cost like a million dollars, so if you haven't had them, I understand, but they taste like a million bucks too. I want you to imagine taking a box of those to your backyard and you have a dead, tr- bed, dead peach tree in your backyard and you just take a staple gun and you just go to town and you start stapling peaches up to the tree. It would be quite a feat if you could actually 
stick any of them up on the tree. But if your neighbor's looking over the fence and he sees it, like he's going to see that you're, you're definitely disillusioned, but he's also probably going to make this observation. Ah, he's trying to make the appearance. She's trying to make the appearance of a healthy peach tree. See, that's what we had under the old covenant. We had a picture of life, but not true life. We had fruit, but we didn't have the right roots. And Jesus came to eternally cleanse. And the point is this. There's one sacrifice that makes us clean. It's one. One sacrifice makes us clean before God. This is not your efforts. This is not your merit. Not your, I'm good at being good. This is not your church attendance. This is not a sacrifice that you could make. One sacrifice makes you clean, and you can't do it. You can't do it. This is the beginning of the good news. You can't make yourself right with God. So let me just ask you this morning, are you tired? Are you worn out from trying to appease God, trying to please God with your own efforts? And you say, well, Jason, you don't know. You don't understand me. You don't know my situation that I'm walking through right now. Like, I'm trying. I'm in the Word. I'm trying to pray. I'm trying to, to work for my um, imbecile of a, of a boss. Like, I'm trying to do all, and you don't know my circumstance. And I would, to that, say, I don't. I, I really don't. I don't know your particular circumstance. But, but something I do know in my own experience is that exhaustion is exacerbated when we're trying to make ourselves clean before God, right before God with our own efforts. Because that will take exhaustion to a whole new level. And so I, I want to I ask you a second question, just a kind of a litmus test to say, am I trusting in that one sacrifice makes me clean or am I trying to trust in my own efforts? Here's one question to ask. When you, when you close your eyes and you, and you think of what God's face looks like toward you, what's it look like? What's God's face look like toward you? Lauren and I have four beautiful kids. Hudson, who's eight. Nolan, who is six. And then our sweet Ruthie is three and a half. And um, our, I call him our, our quarantine baby, Shepherd Lance. He was born six weeks into quarantine, and he is 14 months old now. Um, and and I, it was a very special moment because, seriously... The, the quarantine hit, um, and we were all locked down, and we were like hearing all of this news and these, these, this idea that like maybe hospitals are, are just going to take the birth mom, but, but the dad can't come, and all this noise. We're like, that's, that's enough for us to try to pivot and make a new plan, and we thought, we're already kind of hippies. Let's do a home birth. So that's what we did. We did a home birth, and it, and it would have been awesome if our midwife would have shown up, right, because she showed up five minutes after I got to deliver the baby. So, Lauren, yeah, Lauren, it's pretty amazing. Lauren owes me some money because, you know, I'm Dr. Waller now. And um, it's great. We love our shepherd, Lance. And Ruth, my daughter, particularly loves shepherd Lance. It's kind of the sweetest thing. He'll be fussing in the back seat on a road trip, and she's just like the cutest, like, little mama to him. She'll say, Shep, Shep. She calls him Shep, Shep. Shep, Shep, it's okay. Don't worry. Here's a book. Do you see the dog? What does the dog say? I'm telling you guys, like, it will melt your heart. It will melt, you, melt your heart because she is so sweet until she's not, until she's not sweet. And uh, a few weeks back, uh, Shepard and Ruthie were playing in her room, and they were doing great. So Lauren and I do what we always seem to do with four kids. We were cleaning something in the other room or doing dishes, and uh, all of a sudden we heard uh, just a, a blood-curdling scream let out. And so I run back to her bedroom just to find Ruth with um, some sort of hard plastic object. And I don't know what possessed her, but she thought, hmm, if I take this and strike my little brother in the face, what will, what will happen? Let's see. And uh, he did what any reasonable 14-month-old would do. He, he wails. He's helpless. What's he going to do? He's crying. And, and after about 14 times of this happening, maybe I'm exaggerating, but Several times of this happening in the course of just a couple of hours, I came into a room again, and I just got down. It's probably the 15th time. I just get down on one knee, and I say, hey, baby, I just want you to. No, I didn't do that. 
I didn't get down on one knee. I didn't stroll into a room. I stormed into a room. Any parents know where I'm at? Like, I was, I was done. I was, I was done in that moment. And she, I didn't even have to say anything. She could see it on my face. And I think the words that came out of my mouth were, what is wrong with you? You know, what is wrong with you? Which I already knew the answer. That was a rhetorical, rhetorical question. She's a sinner. So she's just sinning against her brother. She's good at it, right? She's good at it. No, no, no. One sacrifice makes you clean. Do you think like, okay, I failed the 14th time. God's face surely is one of disappointment. His arms are surely folded and he's just, he's over it. For those who've trusted in Christ to make them clean, I want you to hear this this morning. God's countenance, his disposition to you is is always a smile. Even in the midst of your sin and your rebellion and your brokenness, if you are in Christ, if you have trusted in him, if he has made you clean, he longs for you to turn to him. He longs for you to be with him. And that's good news because there's only one sacrifice that makes us clean. Everybody say one. One. All right, let's keep going. We're in verse 15 now. It says, therefore, he being Jesus is the mediator of a new covenant so that those who are called, we'll pause here for just a second. This is, this is really important. Those who are called, this is, this is a way that, that we see God speaking of his people constantly throughout the scriptures. Those who are called, the called out ones, those who he has called by his name, he has called to himself. That's what we see here. And I'm not just making this up. This is Ephesians chapter 2. We were dead in our sins and God called into our darkness and he made us alive together with Christ. God has taken us out of spiritual darkness and he has transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son so that we share with the saints, with other believers in light. We are the called out ones. Just this morning, I'm reading in 1 Corinthians in my quiet time this morning, and I read this in verse 2 of chapter 1. To those who are called to be saints together with all those in every place who call upon the name of our Lord Jesus. Verse 9, God is faithful by whom you were called to the fellowship of his Son. And then verse 29, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. You see, From first to last, salvation is a work from the Lord. He's the one who knocks. He's the one who makes the first move. He's the one who calls. And then his people respond to him. And this should cause us not to just debate about how does this all work. It should cause us to marvel that we are here today, that we are hearing God's word, his voice today. is because he is a gracious and kind God. Let's keep going. So that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance since a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. So them under the first covenant. So he's talking again. He's talking about the Old Testament, the Old Covenant. Have you ever wondered? I've I've wondered before Jesus stepped foot on the scene, how did people in the Old Testament know Jesus? Like how do they have hope? How, how, how do we know that they, they're going to spend eternity with God? How are they going to be made clean? And I used to think it's because they obeyed the law. They did all the right things. They made all the right sacrifices. But that's not the case. They knew that those sacrifices would never atone for their sin. They knew that they needed a rescuer. That's why we see in Romans chapter 4 that Abraham, right? You guys know Father Abraham? Father Abraham had many sons, right? You guys know the song. I said I wasn't going to sing, and then I just did it right there. Golly. Okay. Um, Abraham, right? It says that Abraham in chapter 4, verse 3, that Abraham had faith, and God counted it to him as righteousness. So it was by faith, even in the Old Testament, that we were saved. And that should just magnify the power of the cross, that Jesus can save people in the past and people in the future with his, with his cross. It's good news. For where a will, keep going, verse 17, for where a will takes effect um, only at death, since it is not in force as long as the one who made it is alive. If you don't know what a will is this morning, it's a, it's a piece of paper, a very important piece of paper, because on it has listed out what's going to happen with all your stuff. 
all your possessions, all the things that you want someone else to benefit from, that you want someone else to be a beneficiary of. And if you don't have a will, this is just good advice. It's not good news, but it's good advice. You should get yourself a will. Otherwise, the government will decide what, what happens with your stuff, right? So get a will. It's good. But let's hear the good news this morning. Here's the good news. The good news is, therefore, not even the first covenant was inaugurated without blood. For when every commandment of the law had been declared by Moses to all the people, he took the blood of calves and goats with water and scarlet and wool and hyssop, and he sprinkled both the book itself and all of the people, saying, this is the blood of the covenant that God commanded for you. And in the same way, he sprinkled with blood both the tent and all the vessels used in worship, indeed, Under the law, almost everything is purified with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there would be no forgiveness of sins. Blood is everywhere, like everywhere. And if I'm just being completely honest, like that just feels so gross to me to just think about that. To think that you come into the worship place and wall to wall, ceiling to floor is covered in blood. The instruments like the, the, the musicians would play on, like that's the, the kind of picture that we see here, that everything is covered without blood. Without the shedding of blood, there would be no forgiveness of sin. So do you think that the Israelites in the Old Testament struggled to think like God is holy? I don't think they did. Do you think that the Israelites struggled to think that their sin was that big of a deal? Like they knew it meant blood. It meant that the life of another must be given to purify so that I can just be with God. So that I can be with God. And that's why we see when Jesus shows up on the scene um, in, in the gospel of John, we see John saying this, behold the Lamb of God. Because he is the ultimate sacrifice. The Lamb of God, what's he do? He takes away the sins of the world. Because when Jesus' sacrifice covers you, he takes away your sin. And the point is this, that there's one death that's enough now. All of these sacrifices were pointing to Jesus, the one death that is enough. So in this passage, we see God calling people His own, we see God's promised inheritance for those who receive his promise. And then we also see that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. So let's start here. God has a will for those he saves. He has a will for those he saves. It's a good and and perfect will so that those that he saves would receive the promised inheritance. This isn't a will that we get to negotiate on. We don't say, hey, God, here's the things I want in my life from you. Like he has an eternal will for us and he's the one who plans it. And that's, that's really good news because Isaiah 55 says, as the heavens are above the earth, so high is God's ways above our ways. His wisdom is infinitely better than you. And so his will is a good will in the same way that I wouldn't want my three-year-old who hits her brother in the face with hard plastic objects to say, this is what I want for dinner tonight because she'd pick jelly beans every time. I am so glad that God makes a perfect will for our inheritance. We'll see a little bit more about what that is, but this is God's to make. Psalm 115 says, our God's in the heavens. He does all he pleases. And this should blow our minds today that it pleases God to give us an eternal inheritance in Christ. See, the death of Christ unleashes all the promises of God for those who trust in Jesus. And that's why this text is teaching us that one death is enough. It's enough for what? It's enough to unleash the promises of God on your life. It's enough. Jesus' death secures all of God's promises for you. And that's why 2 Corinthians 1.20, maybe you've heard this verse before, it says all the promises of God, the inheritance that we're talking about here, find their yes in Jesus. That's why it's through him, the scripture says, that we utter our amen to God for his glory. So when we say in Jesus' name, amen, that's not just like sprinkle magic dust on it, hocus pocus, let it be, amen. No, that's saying because of Jesus, If I'm praying your will right now, if I'm praying your promises right now, I have confidence that in Jesus' name, you will do it. You will do it. And so what do we do with this today? What do we do with this today? 
I love that word inaugurated right there. In, in the Greek, I'm no Greek scholar, but as I was studying this week, I, I saw this and I thought, this is, is an incredible thought. That Greek word right there is um, inkinizo, inkinizo for inaugurated. And one of the ways that it gets translated is to open, to open. So why, why does that matter? Jesus' blood inaugurates the promises of God for us. He secures the promises of God for us. He opens the promises of God for us. Because just like this water bottle is filled with liquid that's not going to come out unless in Kinezo, unless it's opened. See, Jesus has opened all the promises of God for you. And so what do you do? What do you do with that? Like what's the application point? That was kind of awkward, but that's what you do. <laughs> you drink, right? You just receive it. You come with open hands, hands of faith saying, God, I must come to you to receive. I'm the needy one, and you're the all-sufficient one. Michael prayed that. I'm the hungry one. Jesus, you're the bread of life. I'm the one in need, but God, you, you're the one who is the abundant one, and you have an inheritance for those in Christ. We see this even in Isaiah 55, hundreds of years before Jesus steps foot on the scene. It says this, Come everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. He who has no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money, without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread? Why do you labor for that which does not satisfy Listen hard to me. Listen diligently. Eat what is good and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me. Hear that your soul may live and I will make with you an everlasting covenant. This everlasting covenant is this new covenant that Jesus would secure with his blood. And even in the Old Testament, it's talking to that. What do we do? We just come and drink. We come and eat. We come and find life because one death is Enough. It's enough to inaugurate all the promises of God for you. And you say, I, don't, I just don't understand. How could that be free? How could it be without money, without price? How could it be free? It's not free. It cost God his son. It was a high price. But one death is enough. So let's continue. Thus it was necessary for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these rites. So again, we're talking about the Old Testament, the Old Covenant rituals, to be purified with these rites, with, with blood, to be sprinkled on the altar. It needed to be purified. But the heavenly things themselves, so this is again showcasing into heaven, the dwelling place of God, His presence, the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. And, and I'll be honest, this verse kind of troubled me this week a little bit. To understand that, that, that the heavenly place needs to purify. Like, why does it need to be purified with blood? And I think that, that verse 24, the next verse really helps us. It says, For Christ has entered not into holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true things, but into heaven itself. Now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. So here's what the author's saying here Jesus isn't just making you fit for heaven. He's actually making heaven fit for you so that when you show up and you have any doubt in your mind, like, do I belong here? Like, he is making it a place where you belong so that you could worship God. And that is an incredible thought for us this morning. See, he doesn't just offer himself repeatedly as the high priest enters the holy places year after year with, his own, with blood that's not his own. Again, the Old Testament sacrificial system. For then... Jesus would have had to suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world. But as it is, he has appeared, there's the words again, once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. See, it's really important here to understand what, what theologians have historically called the hypostatic union. It's a big word, but it, it simply means this. Here's what the biblical view of who Jesus is. He's 100% God. And yet, simultaneously, the 100%, he's 100% man. That's why it's a, it's a union. He's God and man. He's God and man. You see, if, if Jesus is just man and he goes to the cross and dies 
then he's just an example that's worthy to be emulated. But if Jesus is the God-man, which he is, and he goes to the cross, then he is able to rescue. Do you understand that? Because he's God, 100% God. This means that his, his blood, when he sheds his blood, it's God's blood. It's God's blood, which is infinitely worthy and able to forgive. So when we sin against God, a holy God, a righteous God who is infinitely holy, our sin is an infinite offense. Do you see that? Jesus alone, because he has God's blood, can cover an infinite offense. And this should cause us to marvel this morning. This should cause us to just have our jaws drop and our hearts swell to say God himself came to sacrifice himself so that we could know him, that we could be with him. And just as it's appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. And here's where we land the plane. We see that Jesus came at Christmas. That's his first appearance. It's his first coming. We call it Advent. It literally means coming or arrival. Jesus arrived on the scene to what? To deal with our sin once and for all. Once and for all. But when he comes back, he's, he's going to come for his bride. He's going to wipe away every tear from her eye. And the window of mercy we see here, the window of mercy is going to be closed. And you need to hear that this morning. It's appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment. The window of mercy will come to a close. I saw a shirt a few years back, and it said, only God can judge me. And then it was crossed out, and it said, no, only God will judge me. And it had that verse, Hebrews 9, 27 on it. I thought, what a sobering verse. What a sobering verse that God will judge you. But if you're in Christ, you have hope. And that's why our last point is this. There's two appearances. There's one hope. There's two appearances. There's one hope. So that window of mercy is going to come to a close. And I I just implore you, I invite you, I urge you today, if you don't know Jesus, if you've not placed your hope in him, would would you do that today? Do that today. Would you call out to him by faith, knowing that you cannot save yourself? that Jesus alone can save you. I urge you and invite you to do that. And then for the rest of us in here who who are Christians, who are followers of Jesus, what do we do with this? What do we do with this? I met my wife, uh, Lauren, while we were working at camp. We were 19 years old, and we worked at Webster Conference Center just north of town. Neither of us lived here in Salina, but we went there for the summer. We had no idea we would end up here. And I can literally remember pulling up, And I pulled up at the same time as this other girl pulls up and she gets out of her car. And the first prayer that I offered to God for the summer was, Lord, I'm here to serve you. I'm not here to get distracted by women, right? Like that was my first thought whenever I saw my wife, my future wife. And I, uh, ah, the rest is history, right? The rest is history. So after camp, I, uh, I, I shared my, um, just like, this is my intentions. And, uh, and by God's grace, within five months, we were engaged to be married in January. And then we were married literally on the date that we, that we met for orientation uh, as, as collegiate staff at Webster. We, we married a year later when the other staff that for that next summer was having their orientation. It went pretty quick. And the day that we got engaged and I got down on one knee and she said, yes, and I put a ring on her finger in my mind. In that moment, we were as good as married. Yes, we weren't married yet, but we could start talking about what's to come. What what, what are we going to do? What are our plans going to be? Like, how, how is this going to look? How do we go from two budgets to one budget? Like, what is, what's, which was really easy because we didn't have any money. So it was like, perfect, you know, 100 bucks plus 100 bucks, 200 bucks. And we started talking about all these things. And you know what I didn't do? I didn't say, she didn't say I do. And I said, sweet, I'll see you on our wedding day. I'm out of here. Like, that would not have gone well for me. You know what I also didn't do? I didn't say, all right, 
I'm going to show up at your house once a week for about an hour. I'm going to sing to you. I'm going to tell you how much I love you. And then I probably won't think about you for the rest of the week. No, I, I eagerly awaited our wedding day. When people asked us about, about the, uh, our apartment, our new apartment, and they said, what color is the carpet in your new apartment? What color are you going to paint the walls in your, in your new place? I didn't care. I was like, yeah, that's going to be cool. But I just want to be with her. I just want to have my bride. I just want to be married. And that's what it is like for, this, for those of us who have trusted in Christ. We wait eagerly. We don't just get sidelined by the things of this world. We don't just look to the world to provide us the hope that only Jesus can provide us. And so our life looks a lot different. When people are persecuting us and, and calling us names, like we don't lash out in return because we know that we have the Savior and they don't yet. Right? Like everything in our life looks different because we wait eagerly with hope. And so have hope today, Christian. Follower of Jesus, take hope today that he will come back for his bride, that all of his promises are yes, and you can't jack it up. There's one sacrifice. There's one sacrifice that's enough. There's one death that's enough. And he will come again. He will appear again. And it'll be a glorious day because he will do away with all of our sin, all of our sorrow, and we will get to worship him face to face. As 1 Corinthians 13 says, I'll close with this. For now we see in this life, we see in a mirror dimly. But then, when he comes back, face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. Let's pray together. God, what good news for us to sit in this morning, to be reminded of this morning, that our hope, our hope is alive. Our hope is active that Jesus, you are not just sitting back with your feet up right now, resting in heaven, but even now you're our great high priest, you're our advocate, who you're working on our behalf right now. You're, pre you're preparing a place for us to, to be with you forever. And so we wait eagerly today. God, we, we work, we put our hands to, plow tomorrow, to the plow tomorrow morning, and we know that our labor is not in vain. When we work, it's not in vain, that everything that we do can be infused with hope because you're the God of hope and you're coming back. And Lord, I just pray for those in here under the sound of my voice who do not know Jesus, who've not trusted in Jesus, would today, today be the day of salvation, would today be the day that they hear the call and they answer and say, yes. Yes, Lord, I give my life to you. Lord, we love you, and we pledge our lives to you for your glory because you're worthy of all of it. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.